Agir, s'engager, c'est plus facile à dire qu'à faire. C'est pour cela que cette année, nous avons choisi, et ce n'est pas une habitude, de mettre sur scène des entrepreneurs. Ces cinq témoins, ces cinq acteurs qui vont venir sur cette scène sont au quotidien confrontés à cette complexité. Le premier nous vient du Brésil. Il est le porteur d'un projet qu'on pourrait qualifier de « moonshot ». Vous savez, ces projets extrêmement ambitieux. Il utilise une technologie ancestrale pour pouvoir potentiellement résoudre deux problèmes. Le premier, c'est le carbone dans l'atmosphère. Et le second, c'est possiblement révolutionner notre agriculture. Son projet est soutenu par l'ONU. Voici Brando Crespi. Quel plaisir d'être ici à Paris, même si j'ai la trouille. Um, in any case, uh, for the last 35 years, I've worked at the intersection of climate change, poverty reduction, and biodiversity studies. I confess that for the last 10, I've been somewhat depressed about our collective future. But something happened last summer, and um, I read the news that ETH Zurich, which is Europe's MIT, uh, had analyzed 90,000 satellite images and done some major number crunching, and uh, discovered that were we to plant one trillion trees on the one billion hectares of available non-agricultural land, we could reduce greenhouse levels back to the 1950s. Well, this was fantastic. This was a clear strategy, a clear path forward. But I also knew that the Swiss did not know about an Amazonian ancient terraforming technology that combined with uh, what's called today climate smart agroecology can absolutely turbocharge photosynthesis. And um, something happened. Uh, I had uh, an epiphany, and that epiphany I call uh, one million forests. So let me go back and uh, backtrack a bit and tell you that in 1985, a long time ago, uh, I joined a dear friend called Marcelo de Andrade, uh, who's an MD and an explorer. And, and um, we decided to try to address two major problems. One was the deforestation of the Amazon, the other one was chronic poverty. And the two, as Mark said before, are connected like everything else is connected. So we chose the most difficult area we could possibly choose, which was Juruena, um, one of the seven areas of the Amazon most affected by the slash and burn techniques of migrant workers. And, well, what we learned is that all the thinking of the time wasn't very practical, that applying conservation and putting guards and creating oasis and putting fences didn't really work when Juruena was an area that covered 12 and a half million hectares. So we had to find another approach. And the approach was to listen to local communities, listen to the tribal people, listen to their knowledge and help them shape and eventually execute a 50-year vision of their future. This today is called the Shared Value Platform and has been integrated by the World Bank and by the IFC, and we've brought this to 63 countries. Um, somewhat a few years later, it's... Um, uh, 1997, and um, at this point, the concept of sustainability has become a lot more uh, current. And um, we actually won the Mitchell Prize, which was 
which is considered to be the equivalent of a Nobel Prize of Sustainability. At the same time, we also planted two million trees in Jurena for Peugeot. We did it with the Office National des Forêts, and um, we, um, we basically uh, uh, offset uh, one million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but really the most um, exciting uh, breakthrough uh, happened totally by chance. Well, a few years later, we were trying to approach how do we stop deforestation in Africa. And we know that 70% of the deforestation in Africa is caused by the charcoal business. So we decided to create a technology and um, we have a machine uh, which uh, at the time won the Altron Foundation Prize for best technology for the developing world. And this technology uh, called Carbochar, this is a later evolution of it, uh, essentially takes agricultural waste that nobody can do anything, generally is burnt, and invasive species like elephant grass or tifa in Senegal, and turns that into charcoal. A green charcoal, a clean burning charcoal, a much cheaper charcoal, because charcoal is owned by local mafias most of the world around. And, uh, <coughs> and um, the next thing we know, we get a call from Cornell University saying, do you guys know that, by the way, you have the best biochar technology in the world? And we were very pleased, but had no idea what biochar was. Well, um, we quickly found out that Amazonian Indians had noticed that if you add powdered charcoal to the soil, you create something called terra preta. Uh, terra preta dos indios. And uh, this terra preta is a very fertile, rich soil, which is up to nine times more fertile than the land next to it. And this was, you know, quite extraordinary. And so we decided to test it. And we had all the farmers next to our factory in northern Senegal, where we produce this green charcoal. And we gave this powdered uh, product, and um, we were blown away. They doubled rice production and tripled maize production. And I want to show you what we are now doing with biochar and agroecology throughout the Sahel. We're in 13 countries, and very often we start with sterile Sahara sand, as you can see from that picture. There's nothing growing, there's no life. But when we add biochar, which is this black powder that you see here, and camel dung, and often, well, when we can find it, compost, um, we, uh, a phenomena, extraordinary phenomena happens. The soil becomes fertile, and we produce 11 harvests a year of vegetables. And, you know, this was fantastic. Uh, because it addresses big issues of food security. We can turn our deserts into vegetable gardens. And now we know that biochar is called the third green revolution. That biochar, well, there are now 10,000 studies on biochar. And you only need to put it once in the soil, and then for thousands of years, the biology of the soil is affected. And when you add it to the roots of tree saplings, we can double and triple the growth of trees. Well, you can imagine now that my depression lightened up because I, we have these tools, but on top of it, what is happening is that Reforestation is becoming part of our zeitgeist. It's becoming part of our everyday reality. So, for instance, 
in Indonesia, if you want to get married, you have to plant five trees. And if you want to get divorced, you have to plant 25. And, um, and last summer in Ethiopia, the whole country stopped for one whole day and they planted 350 million trees in one day. And in China, uh, where they're trying to stop the Gobi Desert f uh, from taking over Beijing and many of their fertile land, um, there is a project called the Great Green Wall, which essentially has it's the largest man-made forest in the world. And um, 66 billion trees have already been planted there. So, uh, what is one million forest? Uh, it is a holistic approach to solving our climate crisis. It is forestry plus biochar, agroecology, high tech, because there's a place in all this for, bio, for uh, drones, for AI, for blockchain, for gamification, for digital marketing, and last but not least, we are developing some very innovative impact investment models to fund these new smart forests. So, I want to leave you with the thought that we have a chance to not only to plant trees, we have the land, we have the will, it's part of our collective uh, understanding that we need to do it. But we need to do it smartly. We don't need to plant, you know, monocultures or monoforests of eucalyptus. We need to engage in collective smart forestry. And my call to you is, come and help us, plant trees, help us bring this planet back to a place of collective health and a place where we can look at a future of optimism. Thank you. Thank you, Rondo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rondo. Thank you.